Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. I, I think it's a great conference. I enjoyed it a lot. So as you said, I'm talking about uh, this my still mysterious relation between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partitions. So we know that there is the same number of uh, alternating sign matrices as there is of descending plane partitions, but still we don't have a bijection. And um, as you know, um, usually it's easier when you have more statistics that have the same um, joint distribution on the two sets. And I'm going to show you uh, n plus three pairs of such equivalent statistics um, on extended objects. So I will show you some new objects. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Florian Eigner, who is a former PhD student of mine and who is currently doing a, a postdoc in Montreal. Okay, so let me get started. Uh, so here is an outline. So I will start with a short introduction. Um, then I, in the second part, I will uh, show you the extended uh, uh, objects, the objects that extend alternating sign matrices. I call them uh, arid monotone triangles. Um, in the third part, uh, I will show you the extended descending plane partitions, and uh, we call them set-valued balanced column strict plane partitions. Then in the fourth part, I will show you the main result, uh, which connects these two uh, extended objects. Uh, then in the fifth part, I will show you how um, the relation between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partition is a special case of this uh, main result. And in the sixth part, if there is still some time, uh, then I will show you a result that was actually obtained before, but that is actually very much related. So it's about, it, it turns out that the generating function of these uh, error monotone triangles and of these uh, fancy plane partitions, that this is a symmetric function. And if you have a symmetric function, you can consider the Schur expansion. And it turns out that you can express this uh, Schur expansion in terms of a sum over totally symmetric plane partitions, which is kind of surprising, I think. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. So I will show you uh, four types of objects that are all counted uh, by the same product formula, which is displayed here. Um, so here are the first objects, uh, obviously uh, alternating sign matrices. So let me define them again. Uh, so it's, uh, they are always square matrices, and the entries that you allow are zero, plus, and minus one, um, such that in each row and each column, two conditions are fulfilled. Uh, so first of all, uh, the non-zero entries appear with alternating signs. So for instance, look at the third row. So if you disregard the zeros, then you see that ones and minus ones alternate. And the second condition is that the sum of entries uh, is always one in each row and column. Okay, so the first question you can ask is how many are there? And here I've made a table for the first uh, few values. Um, so of order uh, one, there is only one such matrix uh, because you need to have that the row and column sums are one, so therefore you cannot take a zero or a minus one. Uh, for order two, you only have the permutation matrices. So uh, permutation matrices are always alternating sign matrices. For order three, you have the uh, six permutation matrices and an extra one that has a minus one in the center. And for order four, you have the 24 permutation matrices and 18 uh, matrices that have at least one minus one somewhere. So maybe the first conjecture about alternating sign matrices uh, was uh, about the number. So it was conjectured uh, in the beginning of the 1980s by Mills, Robbins, and Ramsey that the number of n times n alternating sign matrices is given by this uh, very simple um, product formula. Uh, so Doran Seilberger was actually the first uh, who gave a proof um, of that conjecture. And actually one should say he gave a proof of a generalization of that conjecture. So he, had, uh, he could uh, uh, have an additional parameter in it. Uh, then later on, Cooperberg, in the same year, gave another proof uh, of the special case, and very excitingly, he could uh, use uh, methods from statistical physics um, 
that involved the, the famous young baxter equation. Okay, so now let's come to the second type of objects, um, descending plane partitions. So first I need to recall what's a strict partition. So a strict partition is a partition that is strictly decreasing, so all parts are distinct. And if you have such a partition, yeah, then you can consider the shifted Young diagram. And I've drawn here the shifted Young diagram for the strict partition 532. So in row I, you have um, lambda I uh, entries, and you have this staircase shape on the left side. So that's possible because it's a strict partition. And then, as usual, we like to fill uh, integers into these uh, cells. And we, we consider here column strict shifted plane partitions. So we take positive integers and uh, insert them such that rows decrease weakly and columns decrease strictly. So here's an example of such an object. So that's not yet the descending plane partitions. Partition. So for descending plane partition, we have to have two further conditions, which look a bit weird in the beginning. Uh, so first of all, you need to have that the first part in each row is greater than the length of its row. And this first part also has to be less than or equal for the, of the length of the previous row. And actually, the uh, example was a descending plane partition. So the first part is always greater than the length of the row, and it's less than or equal than, than the length of the previous row. Okay, but it turned out that actually there is... Uh, these objects are equivalent to certain types of uh, lozenge tilings, and I've drawn an example here. So these are uh, lozenge tilings of, um, of a hexagon um, that are cyclically symmetric, so, um, and that have a central triangular hole of size 2. So um, then next I've listed all descending plane partitions with parts no greater than 3. And for instance, note that also the empty plane partition, the empty descending plane partition counts as a descending plane partition. And if you count how many there are, uh, there are seven. And if you compare this, let's go back to the alternating sign matrix. If you compare this to alternating sign matrix, you see that there are also um, seven uh, alternating sign matrices of order three. And that's not a coincidence because um, Andrews could show that the number of descending plane partitions with parts no greater than n is also given by this product formula. And I shouldn't say also here because actually that formula was proved before the formula for uh, alternating sign matrices has been proven. So um, then for my story, it's also very important that, uh, of course, when, when you have now such a relation, you would really want to have a bijection. Um, and as I said, usually it helps if you have uh, statistics that have the same joint distribution. And in uh, 2013, Roger Behrendt, Philippe Di Francesco, and Paul Sinchistin could prove this for a quadruple of statistics on alternating sign matrices on the descending plane partitions. Uh, so with this, they solved the conjecture, a 30-year-old conjecture, where this was conjectured for uh, a triple of, uh, a sub-triple of statistics. Then I should also say that very recently, together with uh, Matthias Konvalinka, uh, I have constructed a uh, bijection between uh, these two sets. So I have to explain what they are. So n times n alternating sign matrices are these ASMN. And DPPN is the set of descending plane partitions with parts no greater than n. So we have a bijection. And of course, this bijection also implies, by induction, that there is the same number of n times n alternating sign matrices as there is of these descending plane partitions, but it's a really complicated bijection. It's not the bijection that we want. Um, it involves a generalization of the involution principle, but so far that's, that's the only bijection that proves uh, that relation. Uh, so now the third object, um, totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. So here you see a plane partition. So a plane partition is always such a pile of cubes in a, in a box, such that when you walk on top of the cubes and walk away from the origin, so in this case the origin is in the back here, then you would always go down. So this is how you can view uh, plane partitions. And now what are totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions? 
Well, first of all, they have to be totally symmetric. So when you permute the coordinates, then the corresponding cube is still um, in the plane partition. And self-complementary means the following. So this, this plane partition lives in a box. And if you take the complement in this box, you again obtain a plane partition. You just have to rotate it to get the, the same origin. And if this uh, complement happens to be the same as the original plane partition, then it's called self-complementary. And surprisingly, uh, it turned out that also these objects are counted by the same formula. So this was uh, proven by George Andrews in 1994. And now finally, the fourth type of object, so that, that's quite recent. Uh, so these are alternating sign triangles, and they are now, again, more on the alternating sign matrix side. Uh, so what changes is now the shape. Uh, so it's not anymore a square. It's a triangle of this uh, shape here. And you, again, allow ones, minus ones, and zero. Uh, such that uh, the usual conditions are fulfilled. So the non-zero entries alternate in each row and column. Uh, all row sums are one. And for um, the, the third condition is a bit different. Uh, so for each column, the topmost non-zero entry uh, has to be a one. So this is, uh, if, if such an entry exists at all, it doesn't have to exist. So for instance, in the example, uh, the first column doesn't have a one. So that, that's possible. So the, the third condition is different from what we know uh, for alternating sign matrices. And uh, together with, with Arvind and, and Rocha, uh, we could prove uh, that the number of these alternating sign triangles is also given uh, by this product formula. Again, it's not at all a bijective proof. It's a horrible computation. And of course, we would like to have something better. Sorry okay. to interrupt. Just there's a small question. There's a question on the definition um, yeah. of the totally symmetric ones, and just want to make sure that people understand it. Basically, the question was that if in the previous picture one box was missing to make the plane partition totally symmetric on this picture, and just if you want just to be sure that they understand the definition uh, properly. Ah, yes, I see. So it's this one here. Is on it? The right below the green one. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Could okay. Be, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so now let's come to the to the new stuff. So I will show you the the objects that um, extend um, uh, alternating sign matrices. So they are called uh, error monotone triangles. Um, so for that, I first need to explain you. Uh, what monotone triangles are. So you know, uh, or already Philippe showed you that there are several objects that uh, are in correspondence, that are actually in easy correspondence with alternating sign matrices. And one of these objects are uh, monotone triangles. Uh, and I like to work with these monotone triangles. So let me explain you how you come from alternating sign matrices to uh, monotone triangles. Uh, well, take this alternating sign matrix and then what you do is you add to each entry everything that is in the same column above. So for instance, for the second entry in the fourth row, if you add everything above to it, then you get a one. And you do this with every entry, and then you get this uh, zero, one matrix. And this matrix has uh, I occurrences of ones in the i row. So that follows from the alternating sign matrix condition. And now, in order to come from this to this triangle, you record row by row the positions of the ones. So in the first row, you have a one in position two, two so therefore you have a two here. Um, and similarly, for, for the other uh, ones, and you get this triangle array. And you don't have to think for long to see that um, you always have a weak, weak increase in northeast direction and a weak increase in southeast direction and a strict increase uh, along rows. So uh, that's, that's the definition of a monotone triangle. And if in addition you require that in the bottom row you have the consecutive integers between uh, 1 and n, then they are in easy bijective correspondence with uh, n times n alternating sign matrices. So an error monotone tri triangle is now the following. So now you decorate uh, the entries with three types of uh, errors. So either you have a, 
um, you have a northwest arrow, you have a northeast arrow, or you have a double arrow, such that two conditions are fulfilled. So the first condition, if, if an entry is equal to its uh, northwest neighbor, then it must not carry an arrow in this direction. So it must not carry a single arrow in, in this direction, but also not a double arrow. And therefore, it can only carry the other um, arrow. And then the symmetric definition, if the entry is equal to its north, uh, northeast neighbor, then it cannot carry the northeast um, arrow and also not the double arrow, and therefore must carry the other arrow. So it, it's actually very simple. So an error indicates that there has to be a non-zero difference. So that's, uh, that's basically the definition. So um, here's an example of such an object. Um, so first of all, observe that if you disregard, so if you disregard the arrows, then it's a monotone triangle. So it's uh, increasing in northeast direction, in southeast direction, strictly increasing around rows. And then the arrows are distributed in a way, as I told you before, so for instance, look in the fourth row, uh, the second entry. So since this is equal to its uh, northeast neighbor, which is then also a three, it can only carry a arrow that uh, points to the left, to the northwest uh, entry. Okay, so then I define a weight on this arrow monotone triangle, and this is now written here. So, well, I have, um, n plus 3 variables, so now the n plus 3 from the, from the title comes. So the exponent of u is the number of uh, northeast arrows, so the exponent of v is the number of northwest arrows, so with w you have, you have the double arrows. And now let's look at the xi. So you take the sum of entries in row i, subtract the sum of entries in row i minus 1, add the uh, northeast arrows in row i, and subtract the northeast northwest arrows uh, in row i. And, and here I've done an example. So in this example above, we would get this uh, monomial uh, as the weight. And the statistics that I've been talking about in the title, so these are simply the exponents um, of this, uh, in this monomial. Okay, so these are n plus 3 statistics. With the next slide, I want to convince you somehow that this is natural because there's an analogy with uh, sure polynomials. Uh, so what, what's a gelfand zetlin pattern? A gelfand zetlin pattern is basically a monotone triangle where you don't have the strict increase along row. So very simple. Since you know what a monotone triangle is, uh, you know what a gelfand zetlin pattern is. Simply, you don't uh, need to have strict increase along rows. And then you can associate this weight here, and that's very much related to what I've shown you on the previous slide. So you don't have any u, v, and w because you don't have any arrows here, but uh, the exponent of the xi is just the sum of entries in row i minus the sum of entries in row i minus 1. And now the Schur polynomial is actually the generating function of these gelfand zetlin patterns. Uh, where the bottom, where do you see the partition? Well, the partition is actually um, the reverse bottom row, uh, but you have to uh, add some zeros at the beginning so, so that it gets the, the right lengths. And why is this? Well, there is a, a pretty simple bijection between gelfand zetlin patterns and uh, see Mr. standard young tableau, and we know that true polynomials are, in a sense, a generating function of semi standard tableau. And now these arrowed monotone triangles are, you know, in a sense, a variation where you have these this, uh, arrows, and they also play a role in the, in the weight, of course. Okay, so now I show you an example. I sh show you the example n is equal to 2, and not everything makes sense uh, at this point because I haven't defined uh, the other uh, objects. But in the rightmost column and in the fourth column, you see all uh, arrowed monotone triangle with bottom row one, two. Well, it, it's a pretty small example because, you know, for monotone triangles, there only exist two of such objects because, you know, the bottom row is prescribed and in the top row you can only have one and two. So. But with the arrows, uh, you have many more of them, of course. Um, and then I have uh, written down the weights in the second and in the fifth column and uh, the other columns, they don't make sense so far, so this will be uh, the plane partition objects. And I also show you the uh, case uh, n is equal to 3 in a sense. 
So, uh, well, here you see uh, all monotone triangles with bottom row one, two, three. And then I've indicated the errors that are forced, okay? So uh, there are some forced errors. Um, and then whenever you see uh, the stars, then you have a choice. And uh, you have a choice of three uh, decoration. And on the right side, actually, you can see uh, the generating function over all um, error monotone triangles uh, that have this particular a monotone triangle here as an underlying a monotone triangle. So this is a this corresponds to a sum of uh, error monotone triangles. Okay, so now let's come to the plane partition objects and set valued balance columns strict plane partition. So the most important thing about them is is probably their shape. So the shape of them is uh, almost self conjugate, uh, and we we call them uh, balanced shapes. So you see, uh, so self-conjugate means that they are symmetric uh, along the main diagonal, and you can see uh, that I've all of all of those that are symmetric, uh, all of the self-conjugate partitions are actually listed here, but there are a few more uh, that are listed here. Um, and here I gave you I give you the definition. So it's best explained in terms of the Frobenius notation. Uh, so, well, what does it mean, Frobenius notation? So the AIs are the number of cells uh, right of the diagonal cells in the same row, and the BI is the number of cells below uh, the diagonal cell in the same column. And we say that it's balanced if either, uh, so for, if for all I, either this condition has to be fulfilled, so the AI is equal to the BI, or the AI is equal to the BI plus one. Okay, so it's it's almost uh, it's almost self conjugate, and uh, the weight is written down here. So you take the differences between the BIs and the AI, and you add L to it. And uh, below here, uh, you see an example of such an object. Okay, so now um, I can define this set valued balance column strict plane partitions. So they have to have these balanced shapes. And now I allow, as entries, I allow subsets of the integers between mon and n, such that actually strictly above the diagonal, the subsets are singleton, so there's only one element. And then rows are decreasing and columns are strictly decreasing. And I have to tell you in which sense they are decreasing or strictly decreasing. So for the rows, uh, you just have to take the maxima. So you disregard uh, everything, every other thing. So you only take the maxima. And this has to be a strictly decreasing sequence if you read it from left to right. And from col for columns, it's a bit different. So actually, if you consider you know, a cell that is on top of another cell in the column, then all elements in the top cell have to be greater than all elements in the bottom cell. So that's two notions of decreasing and strictly decreasing. And then I have this weight here. Uh, maybe let's first look at the xi's here. So this is exactly what you have in a semi-standard uh, Young tableau. So the exponent of xi is just the number of occurrences of i um, in this plane partition, and then you have um, then you have uh, certain monomials in U, V, and W. So first of all, you have the weight of the shape, um, and then you have U to the number of cells strictly above the main diagonal. Then for the V, you uh, basically need to know the entries uh, on and at the bottom of the uh, on and below the, uh, the main diagonal. And for um, W, you have to take the difference between the number of entries and the number of cells. And again, the exponents of these uh, variables, these are the n plus 3 statistics from the title. So here is an example. Uh, well, you see that strictly above diagonal, the, the diagonal, you only have singletons as sets. Uh, below the diagonal, you can also have more than one element. And uh, well, let's, for instance, look at the fourth row. If you uh, disregard the two here, uh, then it's a weakly decreasing sequence. And uh, for columns, it's a strictly decreasing sequence uh, with the notion that I've uh, defined before. And here is the weight of this uh, particular example. 
So now the case n is equal to 2 makes a bit more sense, uh, this table, because now I've just put in the third and in the last column I've put these um, plane partitions uh, for order 2. And what you see is that there is the same number of these error monotone triangles as there is of these uh, plane partitions, and also for, for each weight the same number of objects actually occur, occurs. Actually, in this small example, most of the weights appear only once. Um, so therefore, in this case, you would know what the weight-preserving bijection is, except for this orange case here. So this appears twice, and the green uh, weight this uh, also appears twice. And there you have a choice. Um, OK, so the main result. I, I think you can guess what the main result is now. So the theorem is that the generating function of these error monotone triangles with a bottom row 1, 2, up to n is equal to the generating function of the set-valued balanced columns with pain partitions with parts that are in the set 1, 2, up to n. OK, so now the question, so why should we care about this new result? Um, so first of all, let me also show you a little bit about the case n equal to 3. So it's, it's a huge case actually already. But um, here we also have a lot of weights with multiplicity uh, one. Um, so that's nice because for, for those objects, you then know uh, what, the, what the weight-preserving bijection has to be. So for all these cases in this list here, the multiplicity uh, is one, but there are more of them. So I've listed all of them. So in total, there are. Uh, 71 such weights uh, that appear only once. But of course, there are also other multiplicities. So in 31 cases, you have multiplicity 2. So for 31 weights, you have multiplicity 2. For 6 weights, you have multiplicity 3. For 4 weights, you have multiplicity 14. For, uh, and multiplicity 5 uh, is for 6. And then there is one case uh, with multiplicity 6, and, and that's it. OK, so now I want to convince you that the relation between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partition can be obtained from this um, more general result. And uh, well, what do we have to do? Uh, we have to consider a certain specialization. And what we do is we set uh, almost all variables equal to 1 except for 1. And that's the W. So the U is uh, 1, the V is 1, the XIs are all 1, but the W is minus 1. And what I claim is that the generating function of uh, error monotone triangles, if I specialize in that way, is actually the number of monotone triangles uh, with, uh, with, this, with the same bottom row. So what do we need to do in order to show that? Well, first, we have to identify uh, the sign that we get in this case. So, um, so the monomial specializes to a sign in this case. So that the weight uh, specializes to a sign. And it's uh, minus 1 to the number of double arrows. So that, that's actually quite simple, I would say. And next thing we do is we identify a set of positive error monotone triangles that are in bijective correspondence with monotone triangles. And on the remaining set, we define as an reversing involution. And that's actually not very difficult. Um, so first of all, uh, let me define a notion. So we say that an entry in a monotone triangle is free if it's different from its northwest neighbor and uh, northeast neighbor. And in this example here below, I've indicated all the free uh, entries in green. And now the important thing about free entries is that you can decorate them with whatever you want. So you can either take the northwest arrow, the northeast arrow, or the double arrow. And for all the other non-free entries, uh, there is a unique choice. So what's now this positive set, the set of positive error monotone triangles I've been talking about in my previous slide? So that will be in bijective correspondence with monotone triangles, well, that's, of course, very simple. You just take, decorate all the free entries with uh, 
uh, for instance, not web error. And f for the other entries, uh, there is no choice, so, so it's forced. So either you have to have a northwest neighbor or a northeast neighbor. And then it's easy to come up with a sign reversing involution. You take the remaining error monotone triangles, take the topmost and leftmost free entry that is not decorated with, with a northwest arrow, and you just change the decoration. So either from a northeast arrow to a double arrow or vice versa. And since the sign is given by minus one to the number of uh, double arrows, this uh, clearly changes the sign. So that's uh, obvious, I would say. Uh, so how about these other objects, these weird uh, plane partitions? Um, well, of course, I consider the same specialization. So again, u, v is equal to one, the x, i's are equal to one, and the w um, is equal to minus one. Uh, and well, what do we do here? Well, first, let's think what's the sign, what the sign is. Well, if you just uh, consider the, the weight we had defined, you obtain this here. But actually, that, that simplifies a lot, uh, and it's just minus one uh, to the number of entries. Um, so what do we do here to show, actually? So we want to obtain these descending plane partitions that I've uh, shown you in the beginning. So what uh, do we do here? So we define two sign reversing involution to cancel certain subsets. And for the remaining set, uh, we will have to have a set of positive plane partitions. And we will see that there are an easy bijective correspondence with uh, descending plane partitions. OK, so let's do that. Um, it's also not very complicated. So this slide um, is about um, the first sign reversing involution. So for that, I first need to tell you what's a principal set valued balanced column strict plane partition. Well, that's actually very easy. So each uh, filling has to be a single, just uh, one element uh, in each cell. This is how we like it, actually, I would say. Um, and of course, if we have such a, uh, if we have just, yeah, if you consider a principal plane partition, then um, then, no, let's, let's do it the other way. So if we have a plane partition and we just uh, delete everything except for the maximum in each, in each cell, that we get an associate uh, principal plane partition. Um, so in the example here, you see um, a principal plane partition um, because, you know, there's only one entry uh, in each uh, cell. And then on the right, you see what you could also add here. So for instance, uh, you look at the nine and you look what is below. And since uh, there is a gap, since there is a gap between nine and seven, you could also have an eight uh, in the in the cell where the nine is. And similarly, for instance, look at the three that is in the uh, in the fourth row and uh, third column. Well, uh, you could also have a two and a one here. Okay. Um, so this is how you get uh, all the plane partitions uh, that are associated to a fixed principle plane partition. Um, and now uh, we define a sign reversing involution. So actually, for every principle plane partition that has more than one um, uh, plane partition associated with it, there is the sign reversing involution. Uh, so what do you do? You just take the topmost and leftmost cell that can contain more than one entry, um, and then you take the minimal possible entry, and what do you do? So you either remove it if it's there, or you add it if it's not there, and that uh, will give you a sign reversing evolution because the sign is just uh, minus one to the number of entries. So in our particular example, this uh, topmost and leftmost cell, this will be the uh, top uh, rightmost cell. And well, you would either uh, add or delete the eight. So that's, uh, that's very simple. Um, OK, so what we are left with. So we are left with plane partition, with principal plane partitions, uh, so that have only an, one element in each cell, and that have an additional um, requirement so there are not allowed to be any gaps when we go down columns, because then we could, in principle, still uh, add entries there. 
so that means that along that uh, for each diagonal entry D, the entries below in the same column have to be D minus one, D minus two, uh, up to one. So the, the columns are pretty much defined, uh, I would say. Um, and now what do we do here? We also define a sign reversing involution, and I have to say uh, on which set. So we define a sign reversing involution where at least one of the following satisfied. So either there is a one strictly above the diagonal, or we have in Frobenius notation of the shape, we have that uh, AI is not equal to a BI plus one for an I. Uh, so what do we do then? Um, so if we have the situation that in Frobenius notation, the AI is not equal to BI uh, plus one for an I, then we choose the minimal such I. If there is no one in row one, up to i minus one, we add uh, one at the end of the row. Uh, otherwise, uh, we remove just the topmost and rightmost one we see. So in the example, we are in this situation that actually um, a two is not equal to b uh, two plus one. Um, so in the left example, since there is no one in the top row, we would add a one uh, at the end of the second row. Well, in the other example, there is a one in the top row. There are actually two ones in the top row, and we, lead, we delete um, the, the last one there. So that's, uh, that's the sign reversing involution. OK, uh, so now we have to analyze uh, what remains. So wh what remains? So first of all, uh, all cells contain a single one. A single element. Uh, the next thing is that uh, AI has to be equal to BI plus one. Then weekly below the diagonal entry, we have these consecutive integers ending with one so that we have no gaps, so that we cannot fill in something there. And there's also no, no one uh, above the diagonal. And if you uh, look at the um, uh, um, definition of the uh, weight, then they all have weight one. Uh, so now the next thing we do is we just delete everything that is below uh, the diagonal because that's uh, that's defined so that we don't lose any information. So, and because of this relation that uh, AI is equal to BI plus one, we also know that the first part of each row is actually one less than the length. Um, and next thing we do is because uh, we have no ones, now in the remaining uh, object, we just delete one from every entry and we obtain this object here. Um, okay, a bit more to do now. So next thing we do is the following. So these, these rows are strictly, are uh, weakly decreasing. So therefore they are a partition um, and we can conjugate a partition of course. And this is what we do. We conjugate uh, in each row, we conjugate the partition and uh, we obtain this object here. And actually in order to see that this is again an object where also the columns are strictly uh, decreasing a non-intersecting lattice part is a good idea to look at. So below here on the left side, you see the set of non-intersecting lattice paths corresponding to, um, to this object here, so corresponding to this plane partition. So the bijection is basically that the horizontal weights, um, so you consider the heights of the horizontal uh, edges of the horizontal um, uh, steps here, and you just add one. And then, of course, you can encode this also differently. Instead of uh, considering the uh, horizontal steps, uh, you can also consider the vertical steps and you can compute the distance uh, to the to the y-axis and just add one to it. So this is how you see that uh, you again get um, a column strict shifted plane partition, but now the condition is that the first part in each row exceeds its length uh, by two. And now in order to come to, to the descending plane partition, you just have to subtract the one and uh, you have to subtract one and then remove uh, all zeros. So, and this in the end will always give you a descending plane partition. Okay, uh, so maybe another interesting question is the following. So, 
assume that we can approve the theorem that I've shown you in a bijective way, so that we could uh, give a weight-preserving bijection between error monotone triangles and this set valued balance column strict plane partition, would that imply a bijection between uh, alternating sign matrices and descending plane partition? And maybe one natural approach one can think of is the following. So you take this set valued uh, balanced column strict uh, shifted column strict plane partition and uh, you, you take those that are left after the sign reversing involutions since you know that they are equinumerous with descending plane partitions so because you, you are interested in them. And then uh, take the corresponding error monotone triangle in the bijection uh, in this weight-preserving bijection and delete uh, all the errors to obtain a monotone triangle. So that, I think that's reasonable. Um, and in the case n is equal to 2, uh, this actually works. So the two um, set-valued balance column uh, strict uh, plane partition that remains are the purple ones. Um, and if you delete the errors, you just get the two uh, monotone triangles of order 2. Okay, so that uh, that works in this case. Uh, this what I call a natural approach. Um, but for the case n equal to three, that can't work, and I I like to argue that now. So for this uh, case, what remains after applying the two sign reversing involutions is is what you see here. Okay, so there are seven of them as it should be, um, and I've also indicated the weights because that's uh, important for my argument. Uh, and what you should look at is the exponent of the x1s. So they are, they are pretty small actually. So for the first one, the exponent is zero. For most of the others, the exponent is one. For the last one, uh, the exponent is two. Uh, and let's compare this um, to the case uh, of uh, arrowed uh, monotone triangles. So this is a table that I've shown you uh, before. And now, well, let's look what could be the exponents uh, for the x1. And now we look at the bottom two uh, monotone triangles. So in principle, you see here uh, exponents of three, but uh, you can lower them by one. Uh, due to this, um, to the x1 uh, inverse you see here. But still, you get two monotone triangles where the exponent is at least one. So therefore, this uh, forgetting errors, how, this is how I call it, uh, can actually not work. So even if you would have this weight-preserving bijection and take this uh, natural approach, uh, that would not give you um, the bijection between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partitions. Okay, so then uh, let's come to the last part uh, of the talk, to, to this uh, sure expansion result, um, where you see totally symmetric plane partitions. So, uh, so note, it's not totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions, it's only totally symmetric plane partitions. Um, okay, and it also tells you a little bit maybe about the proof um, of the main result. So what we did for the proof of the main result is we computed the generating function of this uh, error monotone triangles, um, which is the same as the one for um, set valued balance column strict plane partition, and it turns out um, to be this here. And I mean, the crucial thing for the proof is that we can get a determinantal formula uh, for this here. So there, you can either write it with the asymmetrizer or uh, with the determinant, but what's obvious from both is that you get a symmetric function in the xi. And we considered a very much related um, thing. So what did we do? We just lowered the exponent uh, of the xi. So instead of n, we have n minus 1. And instead of the product over all p less than or equal to q, we have now uh, we disregard those where p is equal to q. Uh, actually, it's not such a restriction because we can also identify objects for which this is the generating function, and there is actually a bijective relation, an explicit bijective relation between those two. So that's not really a restriction. And now, as promised, uh, we consider uh, the sure function expansion, and here it is uh, for this case. 
And note that uh, there are five terms, so that's a Catalan number and that's uh, not a coincidence. Um, so actually it turns out that each of the terms corresponds to a totally symmetric uh, plane partition uh, for, for this small example. Um, so what do you have to do in order to compute the partition that you see in the Schur uh, function? Uh, well, what you have to do is to consider the profile along the diagonal y is equal to x. Uh, so this is how you get um, the partition here, because this profile um, is always a partition if you intersect your totally symmetric plane partition uh, with this plane. You just have to modify it a little bit. So this is what I indicated uh, below here. So you take the Durfee square and you add uh, one extra row, and this is how you get the partition in your sure function expansion. And well, here I, I want to state the precise result. So first of all, um, which, which partitions do you get that way? Well, again, Frobenius notation is a good idea here. And we say that the um, partition is thin if the AI is uh, greater than, if the AI is smaller than BI, then one can show that uh, thin partitions whose parts do not exceed N minus one are counted by the nth Catalan number. So this is why you could see uh, five sure polynomials. Uh, above, then here I again explain uh, what we did. So we take the profile um, along the diagonal, we add uh, one row. Um, this is indicated here. So this is, so for each totally symmetric uh, plane partition, um, we, we, get, um, we get a partition. And then uh, we have a certain weight. So for each uh, partition, we have this weight. So where we have this U, V, and uh, W uh, appearing. And then here's the result. Um, so the result is that uh, the generating function of these down arrowed monotone triangles um, is, uh, has a sure function expansion given as follows. Um, so you sum over all totally symmetric plane partitions of order n minus one, then you take the profile along the diagonal, you add a, a row, um, and then you take the a weight that I defined for uh, a partition. So that's, uh, that's the result. Um, and actually with this, I want to stop. No, <laughs> there is a conclusion slide. So, I mean, for me, the interesting question is actually why is it so hard to find uh, uh, this bijection between alternating sign matrices and um, descending plane partition. So what we could see here is that in order to have a significant increase in the number of equivalent statistics, it was necessary to extend the object. So maybe you say, okay, maybe it's not necessary. Uh, yes, but that, that's the only way I could at least do it. Uh, then in order to get the relation between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partition, I had to consider a certain minus one enumeration. And so the question is, um, are signs unavoidable? So is this somehow necessary or not? And then I also showed you the argument that it's not even clear that uh, if you have a weight preserving bijection between these error monotone triangles and the set value balanced column strict plane partition, whether that would actually lead to uh, a bijection between alternating sign matrices and descending plane partitions. So I would say that at least another twist is necessary. Yeah. And I would like to know that twist. Okay, but uh, now I'm done. So this is my answer. So the picture here is my answer to the question but I've looked for the bijection. So I've, I think I've spent two weeks now uh, and this is the, the floor of my, of my home office <laughs> with all the posters uh, that I've produced uh, in order to, uh, to find this bijection. Yes, but that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose, for this very nice talk. So do we have questions? There is yeah. one question in the chat with which I would start. Oh, Doron, you have a question yeah. first? Yes, yeah. go first. Uh, this is really, I'm, I'm really impressed by this bijection you mentioned between ASMN and DPPN minus one and the other one that immediately implies this by induction. So this is just as nice. But I'm curious, 
Do you have an analog with a trapezoid, with gog trapezoid and magog trapezoid when you stick in K to this bisection? Um, so what I could do, I think, or what we could do with Matthias, so we would have to have this uh, alternating sign trapezoids in between. So we could, if we want, we could translate, uh, we, we could translate this um, computation into a bijection, and then we can also translate the relation between descending plane partitions and uh, the triangles into a bijection, and then we have the bijection between descending plane partitions and alternating sign matrices. So it seems, at least for the approach that we are using, um, we will have the, the trapezoids in between. Uh, yes, but that, that's a long way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But actually, you inspired us. You know that you inspired us to to construct this complicated bijection. You know that. Uh, so when I met you in uh, in Baltimore, I think. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a beautiful bijection. I, uh, even so, it's complicated. It's still beautiful. <laughs> So there's another question which was there earlier in the chat. It was, I think, on slide 15, but you showed it again on slide 36. So Arvin Aya for, uh, asked, why are some of the errors on the outer diagonals forced? It was, I think, when you showed the picture. It was on slide 15 or you, <laughs> the end of, for size 3 on size 3. On, on 36, you repeated the, the, the picture, if I'm not mistaken, the table. Okay. Yeah, let's go to a place where it's bigger, maybe. Um... So here, um, well, for instance, in the in the the first one, okay. So the one at the bottom is forced because so the error for the one in the bottom is forced because it cannot go uh, to the one be, uh, on top because it's it's equal. So Avin, does this answer your question? Is typing. Okay. Oh yes, I see. Perfect. Again, do we have questions in the audience as well? And Arvind is still writing, I was wondering what happens to the other constraint. Which other constraint? I mean on the other side. Well, on the other side, it's the same. Uh, so it, it's symmetric in a sense. Maybe maybe I don't understand the question. <laughs> I mean, if it's okay, feel free to unmute yourself and 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 uh, and clarify. It's fine. Okay, it great. Back. Okay, <laughs> cool. Okay, very nice. Okay, any other questions? Any questions in the audience? Nothing at the moment. Well, I have maybe a bit naive question. This is quite nice how you have these different objects here in between and the different um, um, representations of it. Like, for example, especially for these arrowed or arrowed enhanced um, um, triangle, uh, monotone triangles, I was wondering where there basically is a, your invention, did they appear before or, uh, or is, it, is that well, a new object or? I don't, you got the inspiration from this for these from from some specific work. Well, actually, I had introduced them earlier at some uh -huh. point, uh, maybe already. Um, I don't know, maybe eight years ago or something like uh -huh. that. But now it turns out that they are uh, that they are even more useful than before. Very nice. So they're really a natural object to study. It seems. It seems so. It yes. Seems to capture everything. Thank you. Okay. That's it, perfect. So let's thank Ilse again for this very nice talk.